Cinderella? Cinderella, where are you? Come out right now. Ideally, Cinderella should have come out immediately. Cinderella? Cinderella, where are you? Still no sign of Cinderella. Cinderella! Backstitch fury? Where is Cinderella? Where is Cinderella? Where is Cinderella? I don't know, sir. I don't know, sir. I don't know either. Cinderella, where are you? By now, the stepmother had already forgotten her next line. And Mr. Bhalla, our dramatics teacher, had lost his temper completely. I don't care where is Cinderella. Just dress up any girl in rags and send her on stage immediately. Cinderella, where are you? Yeah, yes, m m m mother, b b what is it? I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Just get me my tea immediately before I lose it. Just for the record, the original Cinderella had slipped in the bathroom and fallen. So she gave me an opportunity to come up on stage and show my latent caliber. After the show got over, the original Cinderella came up to me and said, since when did Cinderella start stammering? You stay out of my play. Yes, I had a terrible speech defect as a kid when I was eight. And they all laughed at me. I was distraught. I was upset. I was angry. On the 26th of January, 2001, a date people in this state will especially remember, I lost a lot. So did many other people. The day began with the usual flag hoisting and the Republic Day Parade, infusing students with a forced sense of patriotism. After the parade got over, our principal went up on stage to make a few announcements. As soon as her speech got over, the ground shuddered and it shook. We didn't realize what just happened. As the tremors came to a halt, our principal fainted on stage. And we laughed. How many of us actually get to see a principal faint on stage? That to a crooked one? We laughed, ignored the moment, and also blatantly ignored the tension that was brewing on our teachers' faces. Our principal was all right, but the city wasn't. It was only when we went out there that we realized what had actually happened. What we had only imagined or seen in our social sciences textbook had turned into reality. Nature at its furious best. Buildings decimated, people broken. When the bus halted in front of my house was when my worst nightmare came true. The house was leveled and the car damaged beyond repair. My parents stood out there trying to hide their hopelessness in front of the oldest child, but to no avail. It was apparent. We'd lost everything. Did we deserve that? We had to move into a makeshift relief camp where we had to borrow bed sheets to be used as curtains for privacy. It was only then that we realized that we'd not suffered the worst of it all because there was something worse that we had to see still. 
people lying under debris, waiting to be rescued. And then there were people dead under debris. We had lost only material possessions, but there were others who had lost family. It was utter chaos, traumatizing beyond belief. Which God, in his right state of mind, would let this happen? A 12-year-old did not deserve to be put into the middle of this, whatever this was. I was distraught, I was upset, I was angry. It was exactly a year later when I realized what is the difference between humans and animals, and how easy it was to bridge the gap between the two and move to the other side. During the early hours of 28th of February, 2002, my dad got calls from his colleagues asking him to be safe and remain indoors. He didn't make much of it, nor did we. It was still early in the morning when a mob showed up outside the society where we lived. They were chanting racial slurs and carrying patrol and torches. They demanded that all the Muslims in the society be handed over to them along with their families. And if their demands were not met, they would burn down the entire township. Blood drained from our faces. Our spines froze. Luckily, the police intervened, and the mob was dispersed. But as the rioting got worse, we had no choice but to flee the city. We grabbed as much as we could and fled the city in an ambulance, went to the airport, and flew out. It was only when we read up later that we realized what had happened. A pregnant woman was raped and brutally murdered. Kids got killed for no reason. I was angry. I was angry that I could not say bye to my teachers. I felt bad. I was sad not that I had to leave my home, my city, but because my last name went a long way in defining my destiny. I was distraught, I was upset, I was angry. Soon after, my father managed to take a transfer and switch to SM. I was there for the next two years. Unfortunately, it was then that the Ulfa insurgency was very active in Assam, and so it was unsafe for young girls to be studying there. So I was sent to Delhi for the next two years to pursue my education at DPS Arkipuram in Delhi. I then went on to pursue my engineering and worked with a consulting firm for the next two years. It was then that I realized that I was not meant to be a corporate drone. It was then that I realized that the creative gene in me was so strong that I had to fly. I could not be caged. So I quit my job, left everything, and with just 1,500 rupees in my pocket, started my own production house and traveled to 20 states across India doing state shows. I would have bread and masala chai for breakfast, a banana for lunch, and bread and omelet for dinner. Wow. It was the most ecstatic time of my life. I just loved it. It was during this time that I wrote my first book and got it published, called You. It stands for You Own Yourself. Six months down the line, my book was announced a bestseller. <laughs> so 
Since I loved writing so much, I knew that if I have to do something, it has to be around writing. That was when I started my second company called thepenpower.com, wherein you can write your stories freely and feel the power of an author. You can write in over 100 plus languages. Sometime back was when I was seeking funding for my startup, my second startup, thepenpower.com. I happened to be meeting a lot of investors as a result of it. One of the angel investors from Mumbai happened to love my idea. He wanted to desperately meet me. So we met. Even before I could finish my pitch, he popped a question. And I quote, he said, so, Sharman, when do you plan to get married? Excuse me? No, I, I love the business idea. It's, it's great, but I think you need a male to be the CEO. So I think you should just step down so that a man can take over. Wow. At the age of eight, I was mocked at because I had a speech defect. At the age of 12, I lost my house. At the age of 13, I was forced to leave my house. At the age of 15, I was sent away from my house. I toured India penniless. I wrote a best-selling book, my second one in the pipeline founded two companies, and after all this, here is a man who's challenging me on the grounds of gender, really? I was distraught, I was upset, I was angry. I happened to meet a person when I was looking for a chief technology officer for my startup, thepenpower.com. I happened to have a conversation with this person. His name was Ratan Chandrasekharan. He belonged to Dharwad, a district in Karnataka, in South India. So after having a very technical conversation with him, I wanted to know him a little bit personally as well. So he was like, OK, so you want to know me personally? We are from farmer background. My father was a farmer. Farmer, do you understand? They were growing in the fields, they were very poor people, what do they do? They didn't have anything to do, they were unpaid. One time, they were so sad, what do they do so much loan? They were dead. They were dead, they were dead. Do you understand, right? They were dead. Suicide? They were dead, but they left their own behind a 35-year-old widow and two little girls. His tone was this blatant throughout the conversation. His composure psyched me from within. His mother worked day in, day out at a factory as a maid in different houses just to make both ends meet so that the two sons could do something good in life. Ratan is a computer science graduate from IIT Kharagpur and his brother studies at the UCLA in the United States of America. He said, and I quote, he said this, Sharman, I was angry. I was angry that my dad committed suicide and left us, left my mom rotting in hell. But had I been angry, I wouldn't have been what I am today. I decided to channelize my anger to fruition to be what I am. You should do the same. Many of us are told that anger is an emotion that is best kept inside. Anger is negative and dangerous, is what we are often told. But I believe that anger is purposeful and has value. If you can channelize your anger in the right direction and use it in a healthy way, 
it can actually improve several areas of your life. So I did what my friend Ratan asked me to. Because I was distraught, I was upset, I was angry over all the events that had happened in the past, after having lost my childhood, my innocence, after being questioned on my gender, after being discriminated, I decided to channelize my anger and do something with it. If an average Indian woman like me can become the CEO of a company, you too can do something with your anger and propel to greater heights in life. Because your anger is your greatest enemy and also your best friend. Thank you.